Welcome to Fine Scale Modeler Weekly. Let's get started with Tamiya's brand new 135th scale Panzer 470A. One of the tank hunters built on the Panzer IV hull, this particular vehicle was built in smaller numbers as a way of adding a casemate with the Pac-42 gun onto standard Panzer IV hulls. The A stands for Alket. The company tasked with the transformation and 278 were built. Although this kit is based on Tamiya's 1994 vintage Panzer IV Asf J, almost everything is updated or new, including the lower hull with upgraded slide molded sides for better fidelity. The only parts carried over from the original are the drive sprockets, return rollers, and road wheels seen here. Everything else is new. For the suspension, that includes the bogies, idlers, and final drive housings, updated wheels, and link and length tracks with sag in the upper run. Remaining hull components include the rear, engine deck, and glasses that fit onto a frame with the fenders molded on. Much of the casemate is a single part with nicely reproduced rolled steel texture cut marks, and weld seams. The top is separate with openings for movable hatches. The main gun is one piece with a separate muzzle. It mounts to the multi-part mantlet with cast texture. A neat linkage will move the sight in unison. A commander figure is provided for the hatch and tools are finely molded. Mounts and frames support photo etch metal mesh panels for the shirts and on the hull. A small decal sheet and color diagrams give markings for two vehicles, one each on the eastern and western fronts. Looks like Tamiya has knocked another one out of the park. Indeed. Next, a timely reissue from Academy, a 148th scale F4U4 Corsair. This kit dates to 1987, so it has simplified details typical of older kits, and the fuselage looks a tad too wide around the cockpit. But you do get a relatively straightforward build and fine recessed panel lines. The full span lower wing shows some detail in the wheel wells, and the upper wing halves nestle into the fuselage at the wing roots. The engine is represented by the front half of the first cylinder bank on a backing plate with separate reduction gear housing. The front of the cowl is a single part. Cockpit detail includes a floor with side consoles, seat and rear bulkhead, and instrument panel. Underwing stores include bombs and rockets. What makes this release timely is the decals include markings for four Korean War Corsairs. Two of them are well known from the recent film Devotion, with options to build either Ensign Jesse Brown or Lieutenant Junior Grade Tom Hudner's planes. The other options are two Marine fighters from VMA 312. It's great to see Academy responding to a recent movie with this release. So if you're anything like me, the biggest challenge in modeling is painting figures. Thankfully, Joe Hudson comes to the rescue with his book, Modeling Military Figures. The 96-page softcover published by Combat Media gives step-by-step -step instructions for painting various types of flesh, weapons and equipment, and World War II uniforms from the US, Britain, Germany, and the Soviet Union. Most of the subjects are 135th scale, but there are chapters for painting smaller scale figures and larger scale busts. Joe also shows his techniques for assembling and converting figures. Order your copy today from combathobbystore.com for $21.95. From ANT, here's a kit that has origins in 1963 and doesn't appear to have been reissued recently, a 125th scale 1963 Corvette convertible. To my eye, the C2 Vets are the best of the family. The cleanly molded body features the windshield frame, door handles, and more. Both hard and soft tops are provided with different glass, and there are three hood styles depending on the version you're building. Power plant options include a 427 cubic inch big block, that can be fitted with velocity stacks or a supercharger, and the stock 327 cubic inch with carburetor or fuel injection. The chassis has much of the front and rear suspension, exhausts, and drive shaft molded on. Metal axles attached to a choice of chrome stock or mag wheels. The front and rear bumpers and taillight bezels are also chrome plated. Both pad printed, radial, and all black aggressively treaded tires are included. The interior with molded seats, gets a dash, steering wheel, and seat belts. Nicely printed decals provide colorful body graphics, badging, dials for the instrument cluster, and Missouri, South Carolina, and California license plates. That's a lot of options to build this pretty car. Finally, let's take a quick look at the latest version of ICM's terrific 148 scale Bristol Beaufort, the Mark 1A. We looked at the original release in detail in the new product rundown that you can find at the link in the description. New here are the updated dorsal turret interior and exterior parts, Yagi search radar antennas, and tropical intakes. Decals and color diagrams supply markings for four aircraft, 
a number 217 squadron plane on Malta in 1942, another in the Mediterranean in 1942, one in the Indian Ocean region in spring 1944, and a training unit bird in Egypt in 1944. ICM is coming on fast with other versions of this Bristol Vifort, which is just great to see. Look for reviews of the Corvette and the Panzer on finescale.com, where you can find tons of other reviews, videos, how-to stories, and more. Go there right now. Fine Scale Modeler Weekly, brought to you by Hobby Zone USA, your source for hobby storage solutions, hard to find hobby tools, and aftermarket modeling needs. Let's talk about saws. Now, saws for modeling, a pretty popular subject around the Fine Scale Modeler offices. Aaron and I are talking about saws all the time, what we use them for, you know, what kind we prefer. To get us started, the standard razor saw usually comes in three varieties, right? Now, first of all, they, they're just big silver rectangles and they can be one inch, one and a quarter, or even one and a half inches wide, okay? They often come with a tail on the end of them and they have a really fine set of teeth for cutting. You can use them just as this is, right? Or you can also insert it into a knife handle and tighten this up. And just like that, you've got your saw. Typically, these sorts of razor saws are used with a miter box. So you can do a nice 90 degree or 45 degree angle cut. And you can see inside the miter box there, right? There are some grooves for you to place the material. Now, what sorts of materials can you cut with this kind of saw? Well, they're good for plastic, wood, and even brass and aluminum. Um, Although, with brass and aluminum, you're probably gonna dull this blade. Moving on, another variety of razor saw we really like to use around the FSM offices are these which, I guess you could say these blades look much more like razor blades, right? At least in size. Now, these saws have handles. One is a straight handle. The other one here you're gonna notice is asymmetrical. And the blades themselves typically come with one that has a coarser cut and then a finer cut. So the coarse side here is gonna, on this blade is 43 teeth. Over here, it's 70 teeth. Same with the asymmetrical. You can see that you can also purchase a couple of different varieties. This would be the straight, the straight blades. Over here, we've got a rounded end, right? And you can see that on the, on the rounded ends, you've got 100 teeth and 65 teeth, right? So a little bit more of a, a cutting surface. And it's gonna give you some uh, versatility with angles. Now, what would you use these kind of saws for? You could use them for plastic and you can use them on wood. I would not recommend that you use them on metal or anything hard like that. And just like with the, the straight razor from earlier, this razor saw is also going to be useful on resin parts too. Really, these are super useful for getting into tight areas, particularly I find on sprue where I'm not maybe really certain that I can cut a piece out with snips and not damage the part where I can come in with this razor saw here, use the fine side and just remove the plastic that's holding that piece there and then come back in and clean up with a file. Another task that you can accomplish with razor saws like these is to scribe panel lines on your model. Um, that's a, a favorite job that Aaron likes to accomplish with these sorts of saws. Similarly, another take on razor saws is this set from Hasegawa in its tri-tool line. Now you can see in here that Hasegawa has provided in basically a photo etch fret a number of different, a number of different shapes and sizes for saws that can be used to get into all sorts of tight places, but Aaron points out that these are really useful again for scribing. Now lastly, in the category of saws, not razor saws necessarily, but saws in general for, that you can use for models are craft saws. This one here is from Green Stuff World. You can also get them from Tamiya and a number of, of other manufacturers. Craft saws, like this one, they come with a number of different blades, but the thing that you have to remember is that the blade 
it, the teeth on the blade is a lot coarser than what you would find on a razor saw like this or your standard razor saw. And the reason being is that they're designed less for uh, fine cuts on plastic or wood and you know, really getting in and removing material on foam board, cardboard, foam in general. They're for large, um, coarser cuts where the f the, you're gonna go back in and you're gonna clean up the edges um, later on. So for instance, if you were making a base for a diorama, then this would be the kind of saw that you would likely be able to use for that. What's nice, however, about these craft saws is that, as you can see with this blade, there's a nice key shape to this, right? Comes down to a, to a fine tip, and that allows you to make tight curves, corners, and even like cut out perhaps the interior radius or diameter of a circle or an oval. To show you the kind of cuts that these different saws make, we went ahead and we took a piece of styrene, painted the end of it black, and then made the cuts. So you can see this kerf here is from the standard razor saw. It's nice, straight, and clean, right? And not too wide. This one here, these were made with the ASK razor saws, and this one here with the 70 tooth side, and this one here with the 43 tooth side, and you see they're, they're fairly similar. Again, a little bit rougher than, than the first one, but nothing too, too drastic, and definitely a lot narrower. And then finally, you can see here, this would be the cut that is made with the craft saw. The kerf is a lot rougher, it's a lot wider, and again, because the craft saw isn't necessarily meant for fine cutting, what it is is for really roughing in some cuts that you're definitely gonna go back and either you're gonna cover up or you're going to clean up. But what's nice about that craft saw is that it cuts fast. Now, are razor saws or a craft saw necessary in your modeling toolbox? Well, that kind of depends, I think. Um, Aaron says yes, definitely to something like this. I say it depends on what it is that you're modeling. Ultimately, it just comes down to what you're comfortable with. However, I do say that a razor saw in your toolbox is probably a good idea. Back when Aaron and I started the NPRD in 2012, I don't think either of us thought that it was going to last for a decade or more unchanged. We've been wanting to go to a weekly format for a while and it's time for a makeover. So with the start of a new year, it seemed like a good idea to do that. As you've already seen, New Product Rundown will remain part of the format of Fine Scale Modeler Weekly. We're also adding tooling around and the wrap up. New Product Rundown, will remain largely what it's always been. We'll rip the top off kits and show you what's inside. Tooling around, well, you've already seen. We're gonna go ahead and talk about tools, whether those tools are things that Aaron and I think are useful or maybe what you think are useful or some of our contributors think are useful. Um, and we'll probably get into some tools that aren't so useful too. Look for some fun to come. <laughs> the wrap up, which you're watching right now, is kind of a free for all section at the end of the show where we get to talk about whatever we think is interesting to us or and to you. Um, it'll be news from the industry and hobby. It could be kit builds Tim and I are working on. Maybe we'll get a guest in every now and then to talk about what they're working on, uh, as well as comments and questions from you guys. Lastly, we want to thank all of our subscribers to Fine Scale Modeler Magazine and to the readers who go out and buy Fine Scale Modeler Magazine from their newsstand, whether it's you know a bookstore or a grocery store or wherever you go and get your copies from. Because it's you guys that allow us to keep doing what we're doing, and that is bringing you the latest information to make you and us better modelers. Thanks for watching Fine Scale Modeler Weekly. We'll see you next week. Front half of the cylinder, front half of the cylinder bank on a bank, on a back banking plate, backing plate. Front half of the. You've got to move it, move it. Shake, shake, shake. Like a nail polish. Thank you. It's actually like press on nails. This one oh. fell off. Oh, <laughs> she's shedding. I it's what? It's not DNA. To <laughs> DNA evidence. Power plant up. Power plant. Include a big block, 427 cubic inch big block. Move. Oh, look at that. <laughs>
<laughs> it's a big block, big block. Yeah, here, let's put the pen away. Yeah, good. All right, I'll put it over here. Because it annoys Diane. No, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure my entire existence annoys Diane. I'm Aaron Skinner. Ah, uh, you know who I am. I'm sorry. I... <laughs> here, we're swap places. There's got to be a way here, Diane, to make that to make that transition work, right? Uh huh. Or maybe not. No, I, no. <laughs>